Welcome to today's update as always. I'm going to start off with a little bit of detective work in New Zealand, trying to work out where this outbreak came from, because it just seemed to come out of the blue after 102 days with no cases. So that's quite interesting. Briefly mention the Russian vaccine, which has obviously caused quite a bit of controversy. Uh, I'm going to talk about the US and uh, a little bit about returning to school in the US. And we'll have a we'll have a drop in on the bikers meeting as well, I think. Uh, the UK has changed the way it's recording deaths. So we'll look at that. And uh, schools are reopening this week in Scotland. What was that going to mean? Is there going to be a massive resurgence of cases? I, I personally have my uh, fears about that. Then we'll look at France and Spain for a bit of context and we'll finish off with uh, with Canada. And we'll see how time goes. I've got stuff from the WHO and um, something else. I can't remember now. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Why, why do more women than uh, men? Or why, uh, why do women have a mild disease, milder disease than men, typically in COVID-19 is another question. I've got a potential answer for. Uh, but let, let's start off with um, New Zealand. Now... Um, Look up the news references for yourself. 200 identified as contacts of the family that uh, were the cluster of four cases in one family, a family of seven. So 200 people have been identified as potential contacts. And I think we can rest assured that they will be actively being chased up now by the New Zealand authorities. They plan on testing tens of thousands of people in the next few days. And they've estimated there's probably 24 cases in Auckland as a result of this family being infected. Now why? Where did it come from? Two theories here. Theory one first of all. Now theory one is that we don't know the details yet but it may be that family members worked at a frozen food facility where there was imported food. So one possibility is it came in frozen products. Now we know from other coronaviruses that they can be frozen. Coronaviruses can be frozen, say minus 20 degrees centigrade, and then thawed out and still be viable up to two years later, and probably for longer than that. And there's a long history in virology of this, that viruses can be preserved in ice. One of the ways we know that the 1918-1919 pandemic was caused by influenza type A, H1N1, that's the type of the virus, is that uh, burials up in the permafrost, I think it was up in Alaska, people that had died up in the permafrost, been buried in the permafrost and the uh, excavated, what's the word, took out some of the bodies um, and, and found the um, found the virus still present in those bodies after, after about 90 years. I think these tests were done. Um, they were dug up 80 or 90 years after the deaths. So we know that viruses can survive in, in frozen conditions. So that, that's one possibility. Now, the second possibility is, um, as of last week, it's been revealed, and this is a bit of a scandal, to be quite honest, in, uh, in New Zealand. As of last week, 63.5% of border airport isolation biosecurity staff had not been tested for the virus. So the majority of people in this work had not been tested. All staff will now be tested, and observations... I would say they need to be tested every week. So what these are, the, the staff here are looking after people that are coming in from overseas, supervising their quarantine at airports, border, border places, ports, supervising isolation and supervising biosecurity. Now, given that there's been no community transmission of the virus in New Zealand for 102 days, these people are at the highest risk in the entire country because they're dealing with people coming in from abroad who could potentially be infected and yet they hadn't been tested. 63.5% of them had not been tested. So someone's definitely dropped the ball pretty big time there in New Zealand. Um, so, as I say, this will be now be corrected. I'm sure these are now going to be tested well, everyone's going to be tested and I would suggest that they're tested every week. So has it been frozen or has it come in from the border? Um, until we know more information of these two theories, um, I would say the smart money is on this one. But we should know that for sure in a, in a few days and it should be interesting as the New Zealand authorities release more information. Now, um, going on to Russia. 
the first batches of Sputnik 5 will be ready in two weeks. And uh, safety concerns are groundless, according to the Russian authorities. So we did this in detail yesterday. This is the Russian vaccine. And it's, uh, they're going to start injecting people in two weeks' time. First batches of the Sputnik V vaccine ready in two weeks. Now, we know that the Russians haven't carried out full phase three clinical trials as we would do in the West. So basically, they're combining phase one, well, two, certainly phases two and three of clinical trials now as they go along. But they're starting to use it on the general population now. This is not the way we do it in the West. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying it's completely different. Now, what will make the difference in the Russian situation is if the Russian authorities meticulously record the detail of who's vaccinated and how they get on. Now, the problem is we're going to have no placebo group here to compare it against. That's the big limitation in not doing a phase three trial. But how, how well this stands up to international scrutiny is how the Russians monitor this and the transparency in the way in which they publish their data in peer-reviewed journals. Now, if they do that, that would be borderline acceptable because they haven't, they haven't had a placebo group. But if they do that, that would be fine. So what we're looking for from the Russians is in the next month or two is detailed peer-reviewed publications with precise data in peer-reviewed medical journals. Now, if they do that, that's good. If they don't do that, then it's, it's, well, it's opacity, isn't it, if they don't do that? So if they want to come up to international scientific standards, this is the way science works. You publish in a peer-reviewed journal, your peers from around the world can basically have a bash at you. They can have a go at you and say, oh, you didn't do that, or you didn't do that. And of course, the proper scientists will say, oh, oh, didn't I? Oh, let me look at that. Let, let me account for that. Let me try and improve. Let's hope that's done. We, we, we will see. If it does, I'm certainly going to uh, be looking out for it and will report on it. Let's hope it's done. Now, the United States, um, uh, reopening of schools, to be quite honest, could be going better. Uh, Georgia, the quarantine numbers up to uh, 1,200. This is in Cherokee uh, County. Uh, a second school was uh, uh, infected there. But it's not just uh, the, not just there. Uh, G G Gulfport, uh, Mississippi, uh, in Indiana. Um, what's that one? Um, Louis, uh, is that Louisiana? <laughs> Excuse me. I think that's Louisiana. So, so there's, there's been cases basically all around the country uh, of people as they've returned to school. Now, OK, these are only four cases in the whole country. Let's hope they're isolated, but we will we will see about that. Now, as a motorcyclist, as I've told you, um, I've taken interest in this Sturgis motorcycle rally. And uh, by the wonders of modern technology, we can tune right into early morning Sturgis. So it's still quite early in the morning there. So let's have a look, see what's going on. Well, not too much at the moment, but uh, any time now we'll have lots of motorcyclists rolling out of bed looking for one of the uh, health food calves on the main on the main strip there. Now, why am I showing you uh, these pictures? Well, I got an email from an academic in the States who's done a survey on the amount of people wearing masks uh, in, the, in the Sturgis bike rally. And um, studying, using the live view at a busier time of day, um, the research assistant could count 512 people in about 45 minutes at 7pm local time on the 10th of August and 2.3% of them were wearing masks. So potential super spreader event there in the making. Many people have said if you want a cheap Harley Davidson, there's going to be plenty going soon in the United States. Let's hope they are wrong. Now here we've got the CDC data from the United States. As we know, well over 5 million cases and 160 3,000 plus deaths. And we can see the cases by jurisdiction here. So California, uh, 574,000 cases. Texas, you have half a million cases in Texas. 
Florida also badly affected 536,000 cases. So I'll put the link in, do feel free to, to browse that. And then we have deaths by jurisdiction as well. And um, this is interesting. So in the United States, what we're seeing is increasing cases as we know, great increasing cases here. This was um, June. And then a levelling off and then a reduction in the number of new cases per day. So the latest figure there is of the... Uh, the 11th of August, 55,540 new cases. So it certainly looks like the number of new cases is going down. But of course, that's still a lot of new people. It's the area under the graph that's the total number of people affected. So the number of new cases does seem to be going down, but that's still 55,000, over 55,000 new cases in the day, which is really quite a significant amount. Now, the United Kingdom... The United Kingdom has changed the way that deaths are recorded. So it had been. The way they were recording deaths in the UK was that they did the test at one point in time. Then when someone died any time after that, regardless of what they died from, that was counted as a COVID-19 death. Now, that was OK in the first week or two when this was being done. But of course, as the months go by, people can potentially die of other things. This is why the death figures in the UK have been changed. And that means, of course, they've been amended down the way. So we've now had 5,000 less deaths attributable to COVID-19 than we thought, according to the Department of Health and um, Social Care. And you can now go in and look at the live data here from the, uh, from the UK government if you would like to. So as of Wednesday, the 12th of August, deaths within a 28 days of testing positive in the UK were 41,000, not as the figure had been nearly 47,000. So this is the number of people that died within 28 days of testing. So it is a more reasonable figure and it's down, as we say, from the 46,000 figure. Now, um, the 60 day figure is going to be coming out soon. So soon what we're going to be getting in the UK is deaths within 28 days of a positive test and deaths within 60 days of a positive test. So the, the data is more realistic there. But of course, this is only people that are tested positive. The actual number of deaths where COVID-19 is on the death certificate is higher. It's about another 10,000 or so. So that's actually the lowest death figure for the UK, those that have been officially tested rather than those that have been clinically diagnosed. Now, what else in the UK? Uh, contact tracing app. Uh, it's been trialled in England today. Now, let me think, when did this pandemic start? You know, th this is just unbelievable. It's been trialled today. The first one in the Isle of Wight didn't work. Now they're using Apple and Google technology, which does seem to make a lot more sense because it's tried and tested. Now, I have to apologise to the Northern Ireland authorities because I did say that there was no apps in the UK. But in actual fact, Northern Ireland has taken an app that was pioneered by the Republic of Ireland and is using it, as I understand, fairly successfully. And I believe that's based on Apple and Google technology as well. So it's gone from the Republic of Ireland to the uh, north of Ireland. And that's being used for some time now, whereas in England, we are still in the trialling situation. Um, really quite uh, quite disappointing. Now, Scotland, the schools reopened last Monday, a few days ago. Some are on a phased return. And um, so it's kind of Scotland's leading the way on this, that their schools have gone back first, but, and they're all back. So there is going to be a level of crowding in the schools. Now, what is going to happen? Well, fortunately, we know that the overall prevalence of the virus in Scotland is relatively low. But there's still going to be odd clusters of cases in schools, I would predict. So what I will predict in the next few weeks is we're going to see some clusters in some schools in Scotland that will result in children having to be quarantined. And then when they open in England and Wales, there could be even more cases because we've got a slightly higher community prevalence. 
So school opening is happening. It needs to be incredibly carefully monitored, I think is the, is the moral of the story there. And I really do hope there's some testing going on as well. But it's inevitable to me that this is going to result in some clusters. Let's hope I'm wrong. Been wrong before. But unfortunately, I think we will be reporting on clusters in the UK in schools in exactly the same way as we've seen clusters in schools in the United States. Now, just before we leave the UK, I want to read out an email from Manchester. This is to do with the level of social compliance or the lack of it in the UK. Here in Manchester, I was at a well-known wholesalers yesterday. No one else was wearing a mask and despite the social distancing announcements on the tannoy, people didn't seem to take much notice. And the most distressing part was when I was having to pay at the checkout for my goods when two people seemed to be having a heated conversation in a foreign language with myself and my goods in the middle of them. I wasn't happy as despite being asked to keep their distance from me, they just carried on regardless. I will not be going back to that branch again. So we had a situation there where two people were having a heated conversation without wearing masks with an innocent person in the middle. And of course, we know that the louder you talk, the more aerosolization there's going to be. So that's... Um, that's a very unfortunate situation. I'm very saddened to hear that. And of course, if those people were infected, spread is virtually guaranteed. Now, sticking with Europe, um, France. Uh, increase in cases in 24 hours in France. Quite a big increase. And there's been over a thousand new cases per day for the past two weeks now. Now, this number here is still... Well, it's a bit over 50%, isn't it? That was the number at the peak on the 1st of April. 4,537 new cases on that 24-hour period up to the 1st of April. But now it's 2,524. Over 1,000 new cases uh, for the last two weeks. So we're not where we were in April, but things are certainly uh, picking up in France, I'm afraid. Now, the virus is reported to be circulating mostly amongst young people. Now, we did read an email out yesterday of a 35-year-old who seemed to have cardiac sequelae after the virus. But in terms of probability, young people are much less likely to get severe disease. It's not impossible, but it's less likely that they're going to get severe disease. We don't know about longer-term sequelae yet. We're still looking at that, and I've got some more studies I'm waiting to look at on that, where there, there may be sequelae from people even had more minor disease. We're hoping not. So young people at the moment, from what we know, can get an asymptomatic illness or a mild illness and make a pretty fast recovery. Let, let, let's hope that remains true when we've got more longitudinal data. But at the moment in France, because it's mostly young people that are socialising and circulating the virus, there's no great pressure on hospitals because young people are less likely to become severely ill than older people. So the hospital situation in France is actually not too bad at all. So the figures are that in the last 24 hours, uh, COVID-related cases in French hospitals were down 121 to just under 5,000 cases in France at the moment of hospitalised patients with COVID-19. And again, by way of comparison, on the 14th of April, there was uh, 30, uh, more than 32,000 people in hospital with COVID-19. So it's down from 32,000 to just under 5,000 people hospitalised largely due to the fact that the virus is circulating in the younger age group. Uh, likewise, in intensive care in France, 12 less people in intensive care, meaning that there's 379 COVID-related patients in intensive care at the moment. Deaths have gone up modestly by 18 in the 24-hour period. Now, the reasons for the lack of hospitalisation, firstly, the virus is spreading in younger people, but also older people and people with comorbidities seem to be shielding themselves. Uh, Oliver, Oliver Viran, whose name I've pronounced wrong, of course, it's French, 
um, Olivia, Olivia Viran. Um, anyway, he's the Minister of Health and uh, the Minister is saying that older people are protecting themselves, therefore less are getting sick, therefore less are being hospitalised, which is good. Schools are scheduled to return to normal in September with the virus, with virus protection procedures. So again, when schools go back in France, there'll be clusters. No question about that. Let's hope it's no more than clusters. Uh, the police are checking to ensure that masks uh, are worn where mandatory and people are respecting social distancing. So given that there's a fair amount of new cases in France among in young people, I must say that schools reopening in France seems to me to be a, a bigger risk than in, say, Scotland. And I, I can expect that we'll see clusters in schools in France. Now, let's hope it's only clusters and it doesn't uh, result in a, a larger lockdown again. The risk, of course, is younger people from schools going back to older people at home, parents and grandparents and spreading the disease to those and spreading the disease to others with comorbidities. Now, still with Europe, the situation in Spain, the lockdown's been lifted for some time now. Again, spreading young people, partying in the young. Um, there's a patchy contact tracing system apparently in Spain. This seems a bit surprising because given that Spain paid such a high price for their lockdown, not to have a good quality contact contact tracing system in Spain does seem a bit surprising that they haven't quite got that up to uh, up to scratch unfortunately. Now cases um, again quite a big increase in in Spain really. Tuesday there was nearly 1500 new cases well 1418. Uh, Wednesday there was uh, 1690 new cases in Spain so we're seeing like the one and a half thousand new cases per day in Spain. Uh, there's no question that the uh, the rate are incre they're increasing in Spain and Spain has perhaps got the biggest problem in Europe at the moment. Now, uh, Galicia uh, has banned uh, smoking in public places. Interesting. Now, I'm just wondering if the authorities in Galicia are thinking that the virus can attach to smoke particles, almost acting like an aerosolization. So smoky environments are certainly one to avoid. So interesting that they've done that in Galicia. And in Aragon, another part of Spain, they are actually constructing a field hospital again. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, they are preparing for the worst in Spain. Now, uh, uh, briefly, Canada. Um, relatively low population in Canada, of course, 38 million. Uh, now, the... Canadian government is still saying that the risk to Canadians is still considered high. It hasn't gone away. Testing's been good in Canada. Positive cases di diagnosed by testing 113,000. Uh, over 9,000 deaths in Canada. Now, looking at British Columbia particularly, okay, increasing 85 cases in 24 hours, meaning that there's 531 active cases in British Columbia at the moment. And this is uh, mostly in young people in the lower mainland and there's been community events. Um, 1,900 um, young people are currently isolating as a result of being at these events. Now that's reassuring because it does mean they know they've been exposed. A lot of this comes to, seems to come from uh, British Columbia Day Long Weekend. A lot of social events a couple of weeks ago. And as we would expect this sort of delay of two weeks, but we're now seeing 1,900 people, uh, mostly young people, isolating. Good that they seem to know, and um, I would expect them to comply with that 14-day isolation. Significant number of cases also linked to travel from outside the province. So that's the situation in British Columbia. Now, the Canadian authorities, of course, published something very similar to what is in the United States. We have the map of the country and we can see the number of cases. So British Columbia that we've just been looking at. And this is this is good because we get the uh, the shape of the graph here. I can't take my cursor off it, but you can see the shape. Of, if you look at this graph here, you can see the shape of, of, that, uh, of that graph. And we're looking for the steepness at the end of the graph. So that gives you the different areas in Canada, which of course you can spend time looking at. 
And just before we finish today, I wanted to show you some information from 1918, the influenza pandemic, of course. So here we see 1918, here we see 1919, and these are the months along the bottom. So we see a small wave to begin with, then we see a much larger wave, and then we see a smaller wave at the end again, fairly distinct waves there in the 1918 pandemic. And the other thing about 1918 I wanted to show you, and, and, and this just shows how fortunate we've been in this pandemic really. Let me just get rid of me a minute. So what we have here, again this is the United States data, but we have the age in years, so children here, older people up here, and we have the specific death rate. Now, what happened in these pandemics in earlier years was, well, first of all, let's look at the dotted line, actually. So the dotted line is the aggregate of flu deaths from 1911 to 1917. It showed this pattern here. So in uh, 1912, for example, flu killed quite a lot of young people. Influenza killed a lot of, well, not young people, babies. Up until the age of four, the death rate was very high in zero to f four years of age. Then young, young adults had a very low death rate, but then of course, as you would expect, it went up considerably in older people. Now, thankfully with modern medical advances, we don't have this appalling death rate in, in babies here. But what we saw in the 1918 was we had the high death rate in babies, as you would expect at the time, and the high rate in older people, as we would expect at the time, and indeed still get now. But we had this peak in the middle of young adults, peaking at what, age 35, 36. And this is due to the acute inflammatory reaction in the lung that people got as a result of this virus, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I thought that was interesting data. And of course, the current pandemic if we were to plot deaths of a similar, on a similar way, we would find it something like, uh, very roughly something like that, with very few deaths in children and uh, younger adults, but going higher. So it just, just looking at that data, it just sort of occurred to me really um, that in many ways you can say we've been quite fortunate with this particular virus because the virus doesn't seem to affect babies particularly. It doesn't seem to affect young people particularly. It's more older people. But there's no biological necessity why it had to be like that. And we've also been quite fortunate, really, that although the virus is very transmissible, it could have been more transmissible. And although the COVID-19 virus does cause morbidity and mortality, it could have caused a lot more morbidity and mortality.